Hi everyone and welcome to Coachy TV. This is a YouTube channel designed to help people get better in the 5K, 2 mile, mile, and half mile, and any distance in and around that area, or just people that are trying to get better at distance running in general. Um, I wanted to make this channel to give um, an option for people to kind of take a look at some different scientific methods of approaching creating their their workouts both in a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and over an entire training year. There's a lot of things that are out there that you can take a look at that tell you what one particularly really good athlete might be doing um, in their workouts. Um, but what th I'm trying to do here is to give a an idea of why things work in terms of a scientific approach instead of looking at maybe what one athlete is doing without looking at maybe what their training age is or their particular um, training environment or anything like that. So this is something that um, is meant to kind of help out anybody um, with the scientific principles and then maybe you can apply them to your own situation once you have that, um, that in place. So. Um, this channel is presented by Kyle LeGiacono. I am the head boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School. I mean, I have been for the last six years. A little bit about me. I am um, a USA track and field level three certified endurance coach as well as a USATF cross country specialist. Um, I am on the Florida High School Athletic Association track and field advisory committee. Um, I have been since 2008. I'm also an FHSAA and USATF certified official for both track and cross country. Over the last couple of years, um, the last three years at least, we've made the cross country state meet. We've also, in the last six years, had 19 medal performances at the track and field and cross country state meets, 37 state bursts the track and field and cross country state meets, and on the club side, 32 junior Olympic bursts the AAU and USATF national meets. Um, in 2016, um, the team that I was working with, which was primarily just made up of Wharton High School boys, got third place in the AAU um, National Cross Country Finals. Over the last six years, we've had 12 kids sign athletic scholarships to compete in college, um, nine of those the Division One level, as well as three preferred walk-ons. So, a little bit about me. Let's get into much more interesting things. Um, what I want to kind of show is where things were um, before I started trying to take more of a scientific approach to creating workouts and how things have changed since then. Um, I'm going to do that by showing some of our time progressions over the various events. Start with the cross country 5k um, when I started here in 2014. Um, 1756 is decidedly not that great. Um, this is for our top five average. Um, and then this is um, 2015. We got down to 1740, 16 seconds better. And I think that was pretty much just because they had somebody that was sort of taking an interest in them and wanting them to get better, and we were running more than they had before, not necessarily because we were doing the best things. 2016, we made the state meet for the first time, and then in 2017, we made it again, but I really wasn't satisfied with only a nine-second progression. Um, just so that you know, this is sort of the, the normal... Um, normal amount of seniors, normal attrition of kids that are um, leaving the program from graduation, maybe one or two moving out, um, but really wasn't satisfied after the 2017 season. So in December of 2017, I went to the USATF Level 2 school, which was sort of my first indoctrination into a scientific approach. I'd been level one certified, but that was really just sort of the basics. This is where I started to get an appreciation of the science behind why adaptation works. So we came back the next year, and again, I did not get a bunch of kids transfer in. Um, in fact, we lost more than we gained into the program that year, and with those same kids, got back to the state meet and went 1651 with our top five average, a 30-second improvement very, very much so better than what we were doing before um, with very similar type of kids, not a whole bunch of brand new superstars coming in. Um, let's take a look at some track events um, in the two mile, 2015. Again, this is this is top four average. Um, I looked at top four as opposed to top five because obviously in track, you don't have everybody doing the same event like you do in cross country. 2015, we were again decidedly not good at all. Um, 11 flat in our boys two mile. 
um, 2016, we got a, a pretty good chunk better in the same way that we did in the same year cross country. But um, again, that was probably just because we were running more, not because we were running the correct type of workouts for the adaptation we were looking for. And then just like in cross country 2017, we didn't get better the way that I wanted to in the two mile, only 3.6 seconds better. That's just not good enough. Again, December 2017, so that would correspond to right here. We got 16.3 seconds faster the next year in the two mile. And then last year, we were able to average under 10 minutes in our top four in the 3200 meter and still a pretty good drop, even though it was pretty much similar kids working within the same training scheme. Let's take a look at some of the shorter track distance events in the mile. Again, we were not good in 2015, 455. Um, got much, much better again as I was working with the same group over time. And then this is that same year that I was very, very dissatisfied. We actually got slower in the mile with a similar group of kids. Came back and we got 8.3, almost 8.4 seconds faster after um, starting to apply these, these better, more scientific methods. And then last year we got all the way down to 431 for our top four average, almost a two second improvement, even though we were doing the you know, it was the same training scheme with the same group, just over time. Does this work with the half mile? I think it does. Um, if you look at the top four in 2015, I'm embarrassed to look at that time of 212. Certainly not a very good 4x8 time by any means. Got a little bit better in 2016. 2017, we actually had a bigger jump. Um, and I think that's based on some of the things that I'll show you in terms of way too much intensity and not enough volume which is why we had a really big improvement. But even though we got um, a little bit longer in our workouts, um, it was a better, more scientific approach. So we still improved even in the shorter distant, middle distant half mile events. Almost three seconds better in 2018. And then last year, 201.42 on our top four average, almost another second better. And that's not just based on their season PR at the state meet we ran 804 so they were kind of consistently in that 201 range so what was going on here before I went to level two and started to apply some of these scientific methods to things um, aerobic workouts were at the fastest possible pace um, you know I wanted them to get faster so I wanted them to just get you know, how, how much can I ask out of them every single day aerobically when we were doing an aerobic workout? Um, and because this intensity was so very, very high for an aerobic workout, nothing was really much longer than six miles. Um, you can't really ask for a lot of volume if the intensity is so, so high. But it made sense to me. Um, run as fast as you can for as long as you can and hope you can do it a little bit better the next day, aerobic workouts. Um, a lot of tempo pace type workouts, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, anaerobic workouts or speed workouts, goal pace or goal race pace, or sometimes even faster was what um, I was prescribing for the kids and done at least twice a week. And, and that's even if we had a meet, um, which is obviously faster pace type of work. How, how fast can we go? How much can we go in terms of fast, 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 fast? That was the whole goal. And the total weekly volume was decidedly low, 30 maybe 35 miles a week. Very, very low volume. Why did I do this? I did this because I thought slash hoped that this would work. Um, you know, again, I wanted to get him faster. Let me see how much I can ask of him each day. Or maybe I, I heard from another coach who was very successful what they were doing um, without even thinking about what their training dynamic was, their kids, their training age with them. I was trying to apply some other people's things to my program as well as just trying to ask for as much as possible. I mean, you, ask, you, know, you run faster, you're going to get faster, right? Um, and it's just not really the, the best way to, to do this looking back at it. After going to level two, here's the way these workouts start to look. Aerobic workouts now are in three different paces primarily. Aerobic threshold for easy workouts, lactic threshold for tempo runs, and aerobic power or VO2 max runs. And obviously, if you just look between those two, aerobic workouts before and after, much more specific, much more scientifically based, much more 
um, thought was put into where the kid was at that day. Anaerobic workouts done at anaerobic power or at special endurance one, special endurance two, and that would be much more rarely than done before. Um, and then a whole nother running type gets put in there, a strength run, short hills and long hills. So as you can see, a much more specific, much more well thought out training plan that was based on <coughs> the kid's the kid's ability level, um, and the volume was much much higher, 50 to 60 miles per week. Why did I do? Why do I do this now? Because science tells me these workouts work. And this is much more liberating than the before, because not only does science tell me these work, I'm not guessing. This is very liberating to know that I'm not just putting a kid into a bad training environment. So, um, the way it's done is primarily through VO2 max testing versus goal pace for the workouts. <coughs> VO2 max testing is ideal for setting endurance runners' workouts because... It allows the athlete to train at their current fitness level so correct adaptation occurs. This is the real important thing. You're not asking a kid to do something that they're not prepared for, that their neuromuscular system is not prepared to do yet. Where are they today? And you're training them where they are today. Um, you know, there are some reasons why you would, you know, at some points not want to do this, but essentially adaptation takes two to four weeks of some kind of training stimulus before the body's going to change things. You're convincing the body that it needs something more to survive. And it takes some time. Um, and just because you're training a kid doesn't necessarily make mean you're getting them better. Um, the law of training specificity tells us that a specific training stimulus gets a particular training adaptation outcome. And it may not be good. Um, so this is something to know that you're training them at least at their correct fitness level. This allows you to keep the easy days easy and the fast days fast without too many of these medium tempo days that you can kind of get yourself tricked into doing too many of. <coughs> um, and it allows the athlete to have some smaller victories throughout the microcycle, which is really important if they can hit these times, which they should, um, because it's their current fitness level, they're going to feel better about themselves. Goal pace can be potentially dangerous for an endurance runners because it forces them to train an intensity they're not prepared for. Um, they're not ready to do some of those super, super fast paces yet. And if you keep putting them in that situation, bad things can happen. Think of it this way. You would never tell a kid to lift weights that they were not physically prepared to lift yet. Bad things would happen. In the same way as if you had a superstar kid in Algebra 1, you would never go and put that kid in calculus the next year just because they were you know seemingly showing some talent you would want to go through the normal progressions you'd want them to take geometry and algebra 2 and whatever your state has as those in-between steps but you need them to train at their current level they can be very very good at that level and you're going to change some of these things with some testing that i'll go over in a little bit but putting them something that they're not capable of is not good long term um it's very draining physically. It can burn um, your stored glucose, which is called glycogen, at a very high rate. Um, the, the human body is really, really good at storing certain things. We're great at storing fat, which is good for low force muscle contractions. But when you start going fast, you start going to your stored glucose or blood sugar, which is called glycogen, stored in the liver, stored in the muscle. Once the blood sugar is gone, your body goes to this for faster pace type work. And we can only store about two hours worth of this. And training at these super fast intensity levels over too much time, you start to lose the ability to store more and more and more of this, um, this fuel, this glycogen, which is really important on race day to be able to use when you need to. There's also the issue of having potential muscle damage as well as there's mental fatigue over time from doing some of this stuff um, and it's very disheartening for the athlete to go through um, different training cycles and not really be able to hit their goal pace because they're not prepared for it yet um, you know maybe their goal pace is their current fitness level but if that's the case you're probably or at least hopefully the state meet is in a couple days 
because you're not going to be able to hold super high fitness level forever. Or if your goal pace is too easy, well, that's got the opposite effect. Um, but you want to train them where they are right then with the idea that they get a little bit faster each of these two to four week adaptation windows. So what is VO2 max? Um, probably some of you guys were thinking about that as I was going through these next slides, so let's take a look at it a little bit closer. It is the body's maximum ability to use oxygen. The bottleneck for aerobic performance is your body's ability to you move and use oxygen throughout the energy systems. As I was mentioning in the last slide, we can store days worth of fat. We're really good at storing that. We can store about two hours worth of glycogen, high intensity energy stores. Um, we can store a couple days worth of water under good situations, but for a number of reasons, we don't store oxygen. Very, very good reason. If we were storing oxygen, we'd have a lot of problems. It's highly corrosive. We would not live very long. Um, it's just not a good thing to store, and obviously in our oxygen-rich atmosphere, there's no real point because hopefully you're never going a couple minutes without taking a breath. Um, but then when you try and increase your aerobic system in terms of a meet, some kind of endurance event, this becomes the bottleneck because we've been designed to use oxygen at relatively lower areas. So your VO2 max is a workout intensity in which anything over this your aerobic system cannot supply the energy you have to go to the anaerobic system and I'll do videos on the anaerobic system um, later on but there comes with some negative consequences with going anaerobically aerobically is a workout intensity a workout um, or a uh, energy production system that makes the ATP very efficiently very cleanly um, so you want to move that VO2 max as much as possible. So that's what it is, maximum ability to use oxygen. And it is typically expressed as milliliters of O2 consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute. So a couple animals um, by comparison of what this looks like is a tree sloth is obviously not a very fast moving animal. They do very, very, very low work over very short periods of time. So the tree sloth is a very low VO2 max of 20 milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute. An untrained human is 36, and so is a pig. So when you're first getting that kid, you are training a kid that has the same aerobic capacity as a pig, not a racehorse, okay? The nice thing, though, about VO2 max and the human body's adaptation abilities is you can almost double a human's VO2 max with proper science-based training gets all the way up to about 74. These are generalities, but you can almost double someone's non-trained VO2 max. A racehorse obviously does a lot of work over a long period of time, so they have a much higher VO2 max. A sled dog, if you think about how much energy it takes over such a long time to pull a sled through a really cold environment, um, so they have an even higher VO2 max. And a hummingbird, if you think about how much work it would take to support a hummingbird's wings going as fast as they are, all the time. That's why their VO2 max is so, so high on this chart. Whenever I show this chart, I'll have a kid that'll say, hey coach, what about a cheetah? They're a lot faster than anything on this, and that's absolutely true. But a cheetah does everything for short, short bursts, nothing very, very fast. And there's a lot of really cool mechanics that happen with a cheetah's anaerobic glycolytic or anaerobic system that burns glycogen um, in terms of its body temperature going way, way up, but their VO2 max is not going to be that high because they're the sprinter. They're the fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, that's not really what we're looking at here to set some of these workout paces. So that's a comparison that you might want to um, just keep in mind as you're training some of these kids. So how can we test this? How can we test VO2 max and how can we make it usable? So there are three main field tests that I would suggest using to get a kid's current VO2 max. Um, the first one is the V-Hill Protocol, championed by Joe V-Hill, one of the most influential, famous, just amazing coach um, from Adam State. They have the most NCAA championships ever. He then moved on and worked with a lot of the professional US athletes, um, as well as just athletes from around the world that wanted to learn from this man. His protocol called for running one mile to exhaustion, 
and multiplying that time by 0.91 because they're going to run a mile faster than their VO2 max would be because VO2 max is typically in the 10 minute range. How fast? How long can you do something for 10 minutes? And there's some limiting factor that wouldn't allow you to do that workout intensity anymore. Um, I think this is really good in certain situations. Um, the one thing to take away from the VHO protocol is it was done at altitude. Um, altitude changes things the way your body gets rid of waste products from the anaerobic system that contributes at this intensity. Um, just a lot of things that go on there that for me in Tampa, Florida at sea level is not, um, th there are just other things that are going on. So I only use this in a very specific situation. And if you're at sea level, um, consider that same thing because um, if it was at altitude, it's definitely going to change the situation. But I find this very good for good mid-distance runners. And when I say mid-distance runners, that very, very specific kid that is in very, very good at doing the 800, but really can't run a great mile. It's too long for them. And I'm not talking about a 400 meter kid moving up. I'm talking about those few kids that you sometimes get that the 800, that's their sweet spot. That's what they can do. And over six years, I probably had two or three kids that fit into this category. Don't just throw a kid in here because they're an 816 kid. Um, you're going to want them to do one of these longer protocols would be my suggestion. Um, but I would suggest this for lesser trained kids. Kids that just came out for a couple weeks, um, you can give them some victory by saying, hey, let's run a mile. But you really don't want them to do anything more than that um, because they're just going to kind of really go much slower and change some of the test data if you have them run a full two miles. So lesser trained kids, I, I would actually do this until they get a little bit more under them. The Birchfer protocol um, calls for running 10 minutes to exhaustion and figuring out the pace. Okay, This is probably the best um, protocol in terms of getting the perfect data where their current VO2 max is. Um, but there's a lot of it's tricky to pull off because if you don't have just a small group, you're going to have quite a time trying to figure this out. Um, if you think about it, I mean, you can go to a track and do it. You can go to a good course and do it. But if you've got, you know, 20, 25 kids doing this, trying to figure out exactly where they hit that 10 minute spot is going to be really tricky. I wouldn't want to execute it. I would only do this if I'm working maybe with like a kid that went off to college that's trying to come back to get some help and I'm just going to run him for 10 minutes and it's going to be perfect for them. But if you're trying to do this with your whole team, you're going to probably have some headaches doing it. So what I would suggest, what I do 90% of the time is the Astron protocol. And this calls for running two miles or you could get away with a 3K Let's say you're getting one of these lesser trained kids that you've had them do the mile and you're trying to convince them to move up to this point and give you a good effort. Have them run a 3K, especially if you don't think they can run a two mile in under 12 minutes or under 13 minutes for sure. This could give them that transitional step by taking out the 200 meters, give them some, uh, another reason to move up. But basically running a two mile to exhaustion and figuring out their mile pace. This is the best thing you can do it with. You set up a course that's two miles, you start them, and you get their time to the end. You can do it on a track. I often do it on a track because we can do it before school where I am, before it gets too hot in Florida. Um, this is what I would recommend most people using um, under a lot of normal cross-country um, high school teams or track team situations. Now, let's say you do have a 400-meter kid in track that you're trying to get to move up to the 800. You're trying to set some workout paces for them. H how can you do it with a sprinter who's probably never run continuously for a mile in their life? The Taylor Protocol says that their current day exhaustive 400-meter pace is about a 65% of that 400 is their VO2 max. So you take their 400, you get you you uh, multiply it by 0.65, and that's their VO2 max per mile pace. Again, this is recommended for 400 meters moving up, um, a starting point for them. Or maybe it's a person that you're working with them, and, and the sprint coach you want them to run the four by eight, and you're trying to get some training targets to, to safely train the kid. <coughs> so be a good good starting point for them. 
these four will give you good working V VO2 max. Now I've just thrown another term at you. What does that mean? The little v just means the pace or the velocity at which their body reaches VO2 max. So don't freak out about this. Those other numbers I was giving you of a human who's untrained being 36 isn't really usable. This tells you what pace does their body reach VO2 max. So let's say you're doing the Astrum protocol and you have a kid run 10 minutes. Their velocity at which they reach VO2 max is five minutes. Um, in the coming weeks or coming days or whatever, I'll, I'll do some videos on how you can create your actual workout targets based on that. But for right now, just know this will give a working V VO2 max number so you can set these workout paces from. This kind of test, not the Taylor protocol because you're not going to just do this and it's not, a, you know, just one 400. I mean, you could, but in terms of aerobic development, you would want to do one of these first three every two to three weeks. Again, if athlete adaptation takes two to four-ish weeks, you want to make sure that you're not... Um, over, you're not under training them, that they might have gotten better in that time and things are too easy. Doing this will make sure that you're keeping the intensity in the right level. And it's really, really good training to do a two mile to exhaustion or 10 minutes to exhaustion or even this in certain situations. It's good VO2 max development to do that every two to three weeks. Um, you can get away with doing some of this stuff in meets. I'll do videos in the coming weeks about that and how to create workouts based on this, but make sure you're doing it regularly, two to three weeks. Don't go two months without doing it. Come back and do this, and it'll also give you some idea of if a kid gets stuck for a few training cycles and they're not getting better in their VVO2 max, or maybe they're getting slower, <coughs> something's going on here that maybe you could identify otherwise. Um... Again, I recommend the Astrin protocol, but find the one that works best for the kids that you have, the situation you have, and what you're trying to accomplish with them. And this will give you good parameters for creating scientifically based workouts that we can talk about in the coming days as I post some workouts on things like how to create all the training targets for this, easy runs, tempo runs, VO2 max runs, how to put all these things together. Um, a lot of interesting things once you understand how to do this. So um, if you have a question, go ahead and leave it in the, uh, the comments down below. If you like this channel, please think about subscribing and liking this video. Um, and until next time, this has been Kochi TV.